This is our final video in our four part series on object oriented languages. In this video, we discuss polymorphism. So polymorphism literally means something that occurs in several different forms. It's derived from the Greek word meaning many forms. There are two main types of polymorphism in object oriented programming, static and dynamic. Now, before we go into this in more detail, you've probably been using aspects of polymorphism for some time without realizing it. If you've ever programmed in Python, take a look at these two code examples on the screen now. What do they do? Well, the left hand version prints the text string hello world and the right hand outputs the number 30. The plus symbol, the third line of code, C equals A plus B, is clearly working in a different way depending on the contents of A and B. In the left hand program, the contents of A and B are recognized as strings. So the plus acts as a string concatenation operator, joining the words hello and world together. In the right hand program, the contents of A and B are recognized as integers. So the plus acts as a mathematical operator to add the numbers 10 and 20 together. This is an example of polymorphism in action. The plus symbol can take on different meanings depending on the context in which it is used. So let's first look at static polymorphism. This allows you to implement multiple methods of the same name, but with different parameters within the same class. And this process is known as method overloading. Now, in order for this to work, the parameter sets must differ in at least one of these ways. Either there needs to be a different number of parameters, e.g. one method accepts two parameters while the other accepts three. The types of the parameters need to be different, so one method accepts a string while the other accepts an integer. Or they need to expect the parameters in a different order, so one method accepts a string followed by an integer while a different one accepts an integer followed a string. Now this last one's not considered very good practice because it can cause quite confusing programs. Now overloading is not covered specifically in the specification. So let's focus now on the form of polymorphism you will see in the exams, which is dynamic polymorphism. So with an inheritance hierarchy, you already know that a subclass is able to override a method of its superclass. This allows the coder of the subclass to customize or completely replace the behavior of that method. We talked about this in part two of our video series. This is a form of polymorphism. Both methods share the same name and parameters, but they provide different functionality depending on whether they're implemented by the superclass or the subclass. So let's actually have a look at an example with some code. So here we have a class for a generic bird object. It has one method, make sound. And our generic bird, as you can see, makes a chirp sound if we call it make sound method. We create another more specific class called duck, which inherits from the bird class. We provide the duck class with a more specific version of the make sound method, quack. We do the same thing twice more to create crow and canary subclasses. And as you can see from the make sound methods in each of those, crows go squawk and canaries go tweet. Now let's imagine we instantiate or create one of each of a bird, duck, crow and canary object and place them into an array called bird array. So what would be the output from this loop shown here? For counter equals zero to three, access the bird array, go to element counter. So it will go to the, the first element of the array zero, then the first, then the second, then the third, and each time call make sound. 
Well, you can see as it goes through the loop, it first outputs chirp, followed by quack, squawk and tweet. You will see how depending on the type of animal object makes sound does something different. So that's a summary, polymorphism. It's the idea of giving an action one name, e.g. in this circumstance make noise, that is shared up and down an object hierarchy, with each object in the hierarchy implementing the action in a way appropriate to itself. Having watched this video, you should be able to answer the following key question. What is polymorphism and how can it be used? Well, that's it for what's in the specification. We've just got one final thing to point out, which may be of interest to you. If you're interested, watch the remainder of this video. So, having spent four videos talking to you about the benefits and the importance and wonders of object oriented programming, here's a little bit of truth. In the late 90s, object oriented programming became a very dominant and popular programming paradigm. Lots of money was invested in it by major companies, including Microsoft. Nowadays, however, it doesn't take much searching on the internet to discover that OOP is considered quite a bloated system that can result in programs that are difficult to maintain, especially with larger projects. Its original creator, Alan Kay, never intended for it to evolve like it has today. He insisted there were only three essential ingredients for OOP, and that was simple message passing, encapsulation and dynamic binding. In reality, the very man who coined the term OOP never even considered inheritance subclass polymorphism to be core concept. OOP is now giving way slowly to functional programming, which is considered to produce much safer and more stable, easier to maintain code. All that said, don't worry about everything you've learnt. It's important theory, it's all accurate, and it's the stuff you'll be tested on in the exam.